Okay, so our final speaker this afternoon is Kurt Schwer from uh, the University of New Hampshire. And uh, Kurt's a, a proper techie geek, so it's fitting we end with one. Um, but he's involved in using his skills in a, a number of areas in uh, planetary, but in particular ocean data. And uh, it's that he's going to be talking about today, how he's developed uses of uh, geospatial data in Google's GeoTools. All right, thank you. Um, I want to start off with a figure to remind you all that New Hampshire indeed does have a coastline. Uh, we have 17 miles of coast. And we actually do touch the ocean. Um, most people don't seem to realize that. And I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, many people at NOAA, uh, Cornell University, and the US Coast Guard have contributed to the uh, products you'll see up here today. And I want to go back into the the not too distant past and talk a little bit about where we used to be before we had Google Earth and, and some more tools. Um, when we were at NASA, we used to have to spend huge amounts of money trying to buy large SGIs, keep them running, and then write all of our software on our own just to make this crummy looking Earth that's up here. And uh, there's no nice texture background. It sort of looks like North America. And we sort of have a red blob on there. And if you click on it, it pops up an actually fairly nice graphic of something, but there's no way to scale in between the two and, and handle all the nice things that Google Earth now handles for us for pretty much free here with KML. And uh, you used to have to get a van and truck it all over to where you're going to do your demo, and today we take our laptop, open it up, and you're good to go. That's had a dramatic effect on how we've looked at data and how much data we can look at. And I'd like to take a, a little bit of a tour of where we went and uh, what kinds of things we're trying to do to support the mariners who are out there on our waterways trying to get commerce through and uh, to keep our economy running. And my background is a little bit of geology, so I want to show you uh, sort of how I got into Google Earth and what we started looking at at first. So here's the Santa Barbara Basin uh, off of California. And uh, we started looking at what we could do with, say, taking a journal paper and scanning the figures in or uh, using something like Flitter Mouse to generate a 3D model and then slap it in there or actually just texture your bathymetry onto the ocean floor when we have a high resolution survey. Uh, this, in this case, it's from Mbari's uh, research ship. And uh, as you go through that, I started playing with the idea of taking each scientist and maybe we could build a, a Google Earth resume. So it's a concept of, for a particular scientist, where they've been as they go through their career. And you can actually glean a lot as they go through the, the geologic record trying to figure out what's going on. A lot of insight comes from what problems they're looking at and when in their career and how that influences things. If you went back a ways, you might see the, uh, the revolution that occurred in uh, earth sciences where people realized that plate tectonics is a real thing. It was a, a huge change of, of thought to people, and a lot of that is uh, buried in the literature in terms of where they were looking on the ocean and how they looked at the earth. They went from, a, from an old model to a, to a brand new model that was really radical change, and so I think as we dig back into that, those archives will start pulling out more of that and really see a, a historical change. Now, to jump into some of our modern tools that we're looking at um, and give you a sense of what we can actually do for the mariners to, uh, to, to change their world and make it a better place for them to, to move about on the waterways and for those who are managing it, uh, I used an open source tool just to get going. And we took a NOAA chart, which are the little red lines you'll see up on the uh, screen. And on that chart, we've dropped it on top of Google Earth. And if you look at the pier in the middle next to the orange arrow, you'll see a really long pier next to uh, a really short red icon, uh, little iconographic uh, description of the pier. Now, which one is right? If you came through in the middle of the night, do you want to find out? Uh, so we've been looking at, uh, you know, if you could just drop a chart in and do a quick look, you can catch a lot of errors that have been very difficult to see down the road. And I'll show a couple more examples of, of kinds of surprising things that we've found uh, and how tools like Google Earth can just pop this right out without having to go through and, and dig through databases and try to look at Excel spreadsheets and figure out what's going on. Now, as these ships move around, there's actually a new technology that's been deployed for about the last five years and is uh, coming into more and more use, and it's called the Automatic Identification System. So planes for a long time have had devices that tell you where they are, and the FAA can tell you what ship is where in the United States. Well, now we have that for the, the maritime world. So ships are trying to put these transponders on, and they're mainly meant for collision avoidance. So instead of just having to rely on your radar, you have a device that actually tells you who's around you and what they're doing. 
Now for us, as researchers, we'd like to see what are the ships doing? Why are they out there? Why are there problems? Why are there areas that are working well? And so what you see up here is a combination of uh, a little bit fancier nautical chart. Here I've used the Earth and Sea uh, charts, and I've taken a couple layers out of their tools and merged it with uh, AIS ship tracks throughout the uh, go entry to Delaware Bay. And you can see that there's vessels moving all over. Some are using the green traffic lanes and following the, the rules of the road. They aren't required to, and there's other vessels who are crossing it. Um, and then there are vessels that have to wait around for some reason. And so we need to go in there and look at as they're out there, what's delaying these ships, and how can we optimize what they're doing while keeping them safe? Now, uh, it's not always safe out there, and things do happen. So we can use techniques like this to look at events like the Costco Busan. Uh, this ship in 2007 ran into, or as they call it in the maritime world, alighted with a uh, fixed object called the, the San Francisco Bay Bridge. And uh, by having the ship track in and recorded by all the transponders, we can see what was going on with that, and the investigators, I'm not involved in that, but they can actually look at these tracks and start to understand what's going on, and we can provide them with graphics where they can go in with a time slider, move things around, they can remove all the ships except for the ships that they care about, and start really digging into why this incident happened. And uh, hopefully with those investigations, they can create new rules or remove rules that were causing problems to make the waterways more effective and safe. And uh, you can combine that kind of information with uh, things like in the bottom left, we have an image that was captured by the uh, ship's radar. And so investigators can really get a fuller picture of uh, maritime incidents as they happen in the waterways much better than they ever have in the past. Now as a part of that, in addition to things like AIS, we also need to get more sensors out there. NOAA, the EPA, and other federal agencies have got a pretty good infrastructure out there, but we need more. We need sensors that really go in and tell us what's going on in the environment. So here I've shown an example of a company that's trying to push that innovation curve, sensorware systems, and they're trying to place uh, all sorts of sensors out in the environment and give us tools to be able to leave, go in and look at this stuff 24-7, 365, good days or bad days, and tell us what's going on out in the environment. That way, uh, we as scientists and researchers can really understand what it is that's causing those uh, trouble spots and why things are working the way they are in the waterways. If you don't know what's happening out there, how are we supposed to help them out? Now, one of the things that we try to do is once you have an incident, there's a short time period where uh, responders have to get in there and really start to work with the local uh, enforcement folks and try to get that environment cleaned up and restored back to where it was. So to give you an example of some of the things that we're seeing in the waterway, I've shown you a picture of a of a grounding in Alaska. This could be anywhere in the United States. There's a lot of incidents on the waterways. It's, it's getting busier out there, so things do happen. It's, it's like being on the highway. You don't expect to have an accident, but every once in a while, something happens that it may even be out of your control. So we've been working on web interfaces to provide a consistent environment for each of the ports to have that they can call up, and responders who come from out of town may have never been in this particular area. They need a consistent view of what's in the area consistent set of data products and access to the management plans that have been in place so that they can quickly respond to things such as oil spills where every minute or hour that you can't get out there and figure out what to do causes you to not be able to recover as much of the oil or debris that's out in your waterways. So here, for example, we're showing a multi-beam bathymetry, showing super high resolution uh, features of, of the waterways. This is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, you can see such things as sand waves that are just a meter or two across, and you combine that with your roads and highways, and the icons show you all of your caches for your uh, response tools. This way, the, the people who come out on site, they may not have been here before, but they can get going right away and start to figure out what they need to do in the first few hours of a response. Now, once you're way past that and you've gotten past your investigations, such as the Costco Busan, the Coast Guard keeps a database of incident investigations. Uh, part of that database sits inside of a tool called MISSIL, and it's the Marine Information for Safety and Law Enforcement database. And as a part of that, we have access to these incidents, and we can color code them. Here I've used the uh, OSHA symbols for, for uh, industrial accidents, not quite the right icons, but it gives you a gist of what's going on in the waterways, and you can see what are the areas that are having the most trouble and where do we need to focus our research efforts to make this uh, a much more focused research and find those problems that need to be addressed. You can see that the Gulf Coast has the majority of the incidents with a fairly good number going on in our inland waterways. So 
those folks refer to themselves as the brown water crowd. They have plenty of incidents that they need to work on too. Uh, there's a lot of tight waterways and passing arrangements that are difficult with these big ships trying to move our uh, economic resources up and down the, the Mississippi River. We zoom in here. This is Norfolk, Virginia, and you can take a look at their database. We started to create tools that help uh, associate these together without having to dig into their Oracle database. So anyone can go in and uh, associate a particular incident with the details of the accident, or you can drill down and get the entire accident report. And that way we can start looking at what actually happened to an incident. Is there something we can address, or is this, say, an active nature or a weird current, something that we can't control? Uh, therefore, there's nothing we can do about it, or can we add a sensor to, uh, to help ships out as they, they come into particular areas? An example of that might be the inland waterways. Some of the locks, as you approach them, have really horrible cross currents that vary with time. So can we put sensors in the water column that will tell you the currents and report that back to the ships? Now, as mariners go through the waterways, they're relying on uh, groups such as NOAA to provide them with the resources to understand where they're going. This is the road atlas for ships. And uh, it starts with field data entry. Uh, there's validation. And then NOAA produces what's called the Coast Pilot. This is a, a document that's been around for a very long time, over 100 years. And it hasn't changed in 100 years. So we have a really excellent tool. Mariners count on this. But can we do better with a geospatial tool? We took a look at LIDAR. And LIDAR is great. You can generate thousands of laser points uh, ranged into your environment. And you can look into, uh, into buildings, see trees, all sorts of stuff. But it generates a lot of data. And you're going to overwhelm your, your people who are trained mariners who are not used to dealing with point clouds with uh, data that isn't necessarily going to help them. This might be helpful for a modeler. And we've looked into what we could do with producing models to supplement those that, that people like Google have created uh, and we can add the, the, the waterway critical uh, buildings and uh, markers. So here we've done a lighthouse on Cape Cod. This is Highland Light, modeled by Christiana. And in this model, it, it gives us a good sense of what's out there. But unfortunately, if we were to do all the lights and waterway devices that we wanted to have out there, it's, it's prohibitively uh, expensive and time consuming to model each of these. It takes us going out to a site, running around the building, building a model, validating it, uh, going through all of our tools, and then dropping into SketchUp and placing it into Google Earth. The last two steps are easy. All that leads up to that is actually fairly challenging for these unusually shaped objects. It would be nice if all of our lighthouses were square, but unfortunately they're not. So we've looked at an approach of uh, get running around with a camera. And cameras are getting better every day. They're adding sensors that we need. Uh, it used to be that adding a GPS to a camera was difficult. Now you can go to the store. And you can buy a camera that has a GPS and it has a three-axis magnetic compass so you know which way it's pointed. Uh, another engineer and I, Matt, uh, we went through Boston Harbor in one day and photo surveyed the entire harbor. Uh, we had very store arms trying to hold a camera stable on top of a ship. But you can go in in one day and survey an entire harbor. Now, how can we use that information to present something to go along with that text to produce a new environment that's helpful for our mariners? So we've come up with a process collect a whole bunch of photos. So here's Matt and I collecting photos in Boston. You need to match those photos to features. You need to crop those photos, register them, orient them, and uh, get them into a database. And once we have that, we can try to create uh, interfaces to these, this new type of data. Uh, we've been playing with, the, as Matt calls it, the multi-rama, uh, where you basically you have an, an oriented uh, image slice, and the renderer picks which one to do based on which way you're looking at it. The nice thing about this is unlike a CAD model, you catch all those features that cue the mariner into what to look for. So if a building is buried among the trees, you capture all those trees that you would never want to model in a 3D world. It's just too expensive. So in our lab, we've gone ahead and prototyped a little version of this to see what it might be. You're welcome to download it and give it a try. We're always looking for feedback. Uh, we've got some features that we haven't figured out how to do in Google Earth yet. Um, as you move around this world, you'll, you'll see pictures moving smaller and larger based on where they are in your field of view. Things are bigger in the center, and they shrink as they go away. We've played with uh, the aspect-oriented which picture to choose. And we've had hyperlinks between the text and the 3D world. We think with the, uh, the new JavaScript API for Google Earth that that might be a great way to, uh, to create at least the basics of this and then work through how we're going to implement some of these other features on top of what exists in the, the current KML. I think we can do a lot. 
but we have yet to figure out what that might look like. There's a lot we can do, and we're going to try a few things in the next couple months. But we look forward to feedback on that first prototype to see what might be a good match for people without overloading the interface with too many things. Now I'd like to show you something in our, our actual in the field implementation of stuff. This is a project that's just going online right now. The uh, Right Whale AIS project aims to notify mariners without any effort on their part of where right whales might be in critical habitats. The right whales on the east coast, there were down to about 350 right whales. And so we'd like to give the mariners as much tools as possible to avoid running into these whales, or if, if it's impossible to know the whale's there, to at least be going slow enough that any impact with a whale might not be fast enough to actually harm the animal enough to kill it. So to give you a sense of what's going on in the Boston area, here's a figure to give you a, a view of a couple of different types of ships and how they use the waterway. Uh, some ships, such as fishing or tugs or research vessels, they're the worst, don't really work in a very nice, easy to work with manner. However, that cargo and, and uh, liquefied natural gas carriers tend to really run a very consistent line. They use the traffic lanes very consistently. And as a part of a new deep water port that's being put in here for LNG right off the coast, um, the Coast Guard, NOAA, and the, the local natural gas companies have agreed to spend money to put in buoys all along this to let mariners know when whales have been heard in a particular area. So let me show you the, uh, the first implementation of this user interface for the Mariners. We did it in Google Earth. It was the easiest tool to create an, an interface that we found. And what we have is a circle for each of our buoys. And when that buoy detects a right whale call, it goes back to mission control at uh, Cornell University. They verify a whale, and uh, the little ring on the screen turns yellow, letting the Mariner know that there was a whale there sometime in the last 24 hours. This way, mariners can use their best judgment to understand what to do, or if you're the LNG carrier, you're actually required by your contract with the Coast Guard to go less than 10 knots. Now that we have those kinds of things in place, we also need to start working on our background data, and we've been looking at how to deal with multi-beam data with Google Earth so that we can have rapid turnaround of validation of our tools without having to deal with the multi-day process of, of processing with the high-power tools such as Keras. Here's an example of a, a really unusual system and how easy it is to drop into Google Earth. I used a combination of MB system uh, and Google Earth to drop in the track lines, make sure that this wave rider, which is a little jet ski-like device with a sonar on it, uh, driven by Tom Lippman of our uh, institution, uh, to actually go in and quick make a model of this. And Into Go through all this stuff. We're trying to deal with a whole bunch of research papers that are focused on various waterways and the bottom of the ocean, things like that. We have a request of Google. We would love to see, instead of just Google Scholar, Google Spatial Scholar. So we've actually done a quick prototype of what it might be to lay in the historic data. We had a whole team of graduate students who came up with this project, and they, they took old multi-beam data that were figures in papers and laid it on Google Earth where those figures should go. Now maybe the end result, you really want these things glued right on the planet where they're supposed to be. But this shows the idea of being able to take a database such as EndNote and export a KML and be able to just spin around the globe and see where the papers are. So if you're interested in Hawaii, you fly into Hawaii and you just get the Hawaii papers. Now I'd like to finish up with uh, an example of a tool that's, uh, that's about to come online. Uh, it'll be a little bit longer than the whale system. This is Now Coast, done by NOAA. And uh, they've worked with University of New Hampshire to create a tool called FlowViz and get it on the web. This is an ARC IMS interface. So if you go to NowCoast, this will be there hopefully in the next month or two. And we've worked on visualization techniques that actually are based on the human visual system. So this sort of starry night view is the, uh, the current velocities along the U.S. East Coast. You can see the uh, Gulf Stream nice and clear. As we're working on this, we thought, what if we did it in Google? What if it was right on a globe and we weren't always in ARC IMS? So we've taken a quick look at that, and it looks really promising. Here I used Flater Mouse to go and drop a GeoTIFF onto Google Earth, and the results are really quite stunning. Being able to fly around and really see this kind of flow model is fantastic. This is something when I had to take oceanography as a grad student, I would have killed for this visualization. I still don't totally understand flow visualization. I'm not uh, an oceanographer. I'm a marine geologist and geophysicist, but it's really great to be able to see this stuff and understand the context of my geology within the currents of the area. 
So thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any more interest in this type of stuff, my blog at schwer.org has a, a lot more pictures of all this stuff, and you can download some of the files. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Yes. Can you repeat the question? We would rather have Google do that than us, yes. Um, it would be great to have a street view car that we plunk on top of a ship and drive around a harbor. We're, tr we're in a way emulating that, except for one aspect. In street view, you want to show everything because people are interested in all sorts of different features. Here we have a community that, that actually wants you to go in and decimate the data and just find those key features. So when they're coming into a harbor, they don't want to know every nook and cranny of the harbor. They want to know the key lighthouses, the buildings, the features they need to go uh, to where they're going. So they're going to aim for that lighthouse, take a left at the third pier, and head for home. And it may be foggy and dark, so they want to have that, that best knowledge without all of the street view-like stuff in there. So we have an extra decimation problem. Yes, next question. Now coast? That one? Before the whales. That one, yes. This is not Google Earth. This is our in-house OpenGL implementation, and we hope to have a Google Earth implementation. We have a couple different teams taking their own take on it. Um, we have one in Florida. We've looked at photo overlays, and we think that might be a, a way to go. We have some questions on how to control the image views to maybe do something like the multi-rama. Uh, we think you might be able to pull that out with sort of a you know, uh, level of detail region type feature where you pick which region and it's not true level of detail. So perhaps those kinds of things, but this is not currently Google Earth. I wish it was, but it's not. Any more questions? Thank you. Photoshop that.